All right. Okay. Ready? Hit me. Hello, Battletech fans. Welcome to Renegade HPG. This is Travis, and today I'm excited to welcome Lauren Coleman to the podcast. Lauren is the owner of Catalyst Game Labs and current steward of the Battletech license. For our conversation today, we're going to dive into some of Lauren's early history as a creator for the IP and explore his experiences with Catalyst Game Labs and bring this world back into the spotlight within the gaming community. Lauren, thanks for joining me today. I'm happy to be here. Very excited. Definitely. Well, I uh, before we dive in, I, I did want to give a shout out to the Wolfnet guys because they had uh, done a podcast with you in January. And so, you know, anybody listening, uh, I encourage you to check that out after this one. Um, I want to make sure that we're not kind of retreading a lot of the same stuff because I got tons of stuff I want to go over. Um, and so uh, if you want some more kind of story time and stuff, I definitely, uh, you know, recommend people swing over there as a compliment to this podcast. But Lauren, I wanted to, you know, I love talking about creators. I love hearing about the creative process, kind of get that little history into, into Battletech from the perspective of those creators. And for you, Coming into Battletech as a writer, um, I'd really like to hear about kind of those those early experiences you had first as a contributor to the source books, and then kind of you know evolving in, in, into the novel side of things. But uh, you know, to focus first on those source books specifically, I'm curious what that process is like because there's so many there's so many authors credited on those source books, and uh, you never know who's doing what within them. And I know that you spent a lot of time as a freelancer, and that's kind of how you guys continue to kind of outsource a lot of your work, especially your writing work um, now. And uh, what kind of insight you can give into what that is like and how you contribute and where the direction is coming and how you kind of bring your own vision into the universe uh, through that medium. Wow, there's a lot in there to unpack. Um, so, okay. Yeah, I, I got my start by, uh, uh, I met uh, Sam Lewis at a writing uh, a writer's uh, uh, workshop. I uh, didn't know who he was. A friend of mine, Greg Gordon, introduced us. Greg was a major writer at that point for doing uh, game design. He was designing Earth Dawn for FASA, among other things. Met Sam Lewis. Sam invited me to just write a, a couple of things up for uh, for Battletech. And so he handed me off to Brian Neistel. Brian gave me an assignment. I did that. I did uh, How to Game Master the current Baltech RPG um, section. And Brian liked my writing. So Brian said, hey, how about, there's this new idea we have called a field manual, uh, about 80,000 words. Go write that for us. <laughs> no, hardly any, it's, like, it's just a, you know, a, a, a deep dive on the on the cross combine, T.O.N.E. units, histories, people, it was wide open, um, complete Wild West for me. And I went from writing like a 10,000 word piece to an 80,000 word source book. Um, and Brian could be right in the deep end of the pool and then tied weights around my ankles. Um, very nice guy. Awesome. And uh, it was it was great. I mean, I, I already knew Baltech. I'd been reading, uh, reading it, had played it some. And uh, so it was very exciting for me. And I did that. <clears throat> And that started my kind of like a rise at FASA because I, I put I pulled that off in pretty record time. And uh, <clears throat> suddenly I was writing at least two source books a year at that point for FASA almost immediately. I could turn in stuff. I could write fast, hit deadlines. I could work with minimal supervision. Um, and so they really gave me a lot of room to play. And I mean, I invented this, the, the almost the format for the field manuals. Just sitting there as I wrote, I discovered where how how to format what I wanted to say, and that became a format for all the field manuals thereafter. And uh, uh, they gave me a lot of room, so I played I played a lot. I was able to put my own stamp on some of the the people and events of the timeline. Um, I made up made up a lot of background material. That eventually showed up in later source books and novels. Um, it was such a it's such a huge universe. I mean, there's no way to traffic cop at all. So they they didn't even try. They they trusted me not to go too far off the reservation, and uh, we had a great time. So that's how I kind of started writing the source books, and I, I was like one of their premier. Me, Chris Hartford, eventually Chris Trossen. Uh, You know, we were doing all of us were doing anywhere from one, two, even sometimes three source books in a year. 
sometimes working together, sometimes not. Little stuff like Dragon Roar's campaign play mm-hmm. up to force man or uh, uh, the the uh, field manuals and big chunks of other rule books. So it was great. And I started doing like fiction snippets in there, and that was uh, helped me make my case for doing a Baltic novel. I met Donna Ippolito, the editor at Gen Con, my first Gen Con that next year. And she looked at some stuff I had written and said, hey, this is good stuff, but you're like a whole year out of date, at least a year, if not two years out of date. We are writing way past this era because they, 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 were, they were planning out the Twilight of the Clans at that point. Okay. So I was so far behind the curve as to where the storyline was being written. She said, this is good, but we can't use it. But I'll keep you in mind. And I think it was only like maybe a few months after Gen Con, she called me and said, someone just dropped their novel. They, they can't get it done. They, they you know, they're basically they punted. And we've got a hole in our schedule. Uh, would you like to write a Baltic novel in the current timeline? It was basically a setting. It was set really close to Twilight of the Clans, but it would not be involved. It would be like back in the inner sphere, what's been going on. Yep. I said, well, of course I would like to do that. And she said, and we need it in two months. And can you do that? I said, of course I can do that. Hung up the phone and went, okay, now what do I do? Because I had no idea if I can write a book, in, a novel in two months' time. Mm-hmm. But, uh, so that's how I got my first break in doing uh, a novel. And then I called Brian, and Brian said, yeah, we want you to do this novel. Donna said you're doing it. So here's the thing. You must do the, these seven things. And they were, like, all over the map, you know, Make the Capella Confederation cool was number one on the list. I'm like, okay, come on. They've never been cool. Um, <laughs> I can do that. Yep. You know, show off some mercenaries, play with the periphery. You know, like he had all these weird um, touchstones. And I looked at that and went, okay, I see a way to do it, but I have to have a main character. I need a major character. I need Sun Tzu Lao to make this, tie this together. So Brian went to Mike Stackpole and said, can Lauren borrow Sun Tzu? And Mike said, let him borrow and see what he does with him. And that was double blind. Mm-hmm. So that's how that that was my avenue into the industry. I, I had done a little work before then for like Mayfair Games. I think I wrote one thing for uh, um, another company. I can't remember. Um, Rollades, the Rollades line. That was also Mayfair Games. But that's you know that was my big my big splash coming in. Definitely. And I worked for FASA. And I worked for FASA pretty much. Uh, 90% was my work for the next several years was all FASA all the time. So that's, that's how I came in. I love that. So, uh, so you traded, I gave you a lot to unpack. You gave me a lot to unpack. And so I want to, so I got a lot of questions coming out of that. Yeah. The field manual, the field manual first. And so when you're, I know it must have been a lot easier kind of in the early days writing those things because you don't have as much established lore going on that you got to go back and check and make sure you're not conflicting. Um, and so from what you were saying, it sounds like you that was early enough where there was a lot of stuff you were able to kind of just freely develop the universe. I'm curious how much time when you're writing something like that is spent in kind of going back and, and kind of double checking and researching what's been done before and what's already been established first, kind of moving it forward with your own storytelling. Writers become instant experts. We we know how to get the most out of the, the most information and the least amount of research because we, we just don't have time. Yeah. In this case, the biggest issue was knowing which units in the combine were storied units. They had, they had backstory somewhere else in the source books. Mm -hmm. Um, At that point, I had photocopies of the house books that Brian had given me and some other digital stuff. But it was hard because some of these units that were like, you know, the fourth Tossetti, the the Sword of Light, the the Ganyosha, um, the Vagan, uh, whatever Theodore's unit was. I mean, so I had to go read Air of the Dragon just to talk about, you know, Theodore's, you know, uh, uh, regiment and you know, the sort of light appears in several source books. And I, I got, I gleaned as much as I could, as fast as I could. There was no research team. There was no continuity checkers. It was me on the phone with Brian Nice still occasionally going, is there anything about the art cab legion I need to be aware of? He's like, nah, don't worry about it. Just go. You know, how about the sort of light? Oh yeah. Make sure you mention like this and this and this and just go. Yeah. So there was a lot of just, if we get it wrong, we'll, we'll deal with it later. 
Uh, fortunately, I think I got most of it. You know, there were a few places where I had some, uh, maybe some overlap where I, I missed a bet. But mostly, I my my, re, my quick research was pretty solid. And uh, again, Brian's advice because Brian knew the source books; he knew where to find the quick, the big references, and that assisted to be uh, a great deal. So yeah. that so yeah, it was it was wide open, but still, I was always cognizant of the fact that there was still a lot of history out there in the house books and the Succession Wars manuals and all the stuff that was out there that I had to go find because I wanted to make sure. I didn't want a fan to come up to me at a convention going, you said they were here and they were actually over here. And okay. Yeah. And you're like, yeah. That's right. I, I'm curious because there's a lot of books that are written from the, from a future perspective from Comstar or to Blake, whoever it might be, who's kind of the, the overseer faction at the time. And is there, is there a coordination from the staff other than just kind of giving you guys kind of a way to maneuver around? Is there a coordination in terms of what is, what is more definitive than the other? If you're seeing something, you know, from that future perspective, is that kind of the go-to when you see conflicts versus what might be in a book from the perspective of the faction itself? There's a lot of leeway we have in that, how we present the book. Like, you know, the the, the field majors, I believe, were presented as an internal document. And so we, we I think I think on that one, we bypassed the Comstar's outside perspective where they were co always commenting on things mm -hmm. we wrote it we did it as a complete internal uh true document um every source book was different um we did source books that were completely deniable um things that were like you know here's a source book nothing of which may be true some of which probably is we won't we won't know for years mm -hmm. we will decide late you know, we, that was the like the jihad books we did right. they were completely apocryphal um, is how we wrote that. That was by design, because we were still trying to get a handle on how long this was going to run. We were we were working without a net at that point, and so we had to have everything had to be deniable, uh, at least to some extent, so we could then backfill later with what was actually going on, because nobody knew. They say write a source book. What's going on? We can't tell you. There's some fighting. Word of Blake's going crazy. There's some jumbled communications. Um, everything's deniable just write something i'm like uh, okay so and, you know, that was that kind of thing was yeah, that was that, that's at that point i think catalyst was actually publishing or we were that was at the very end of the fasa era beginning of or fan pro era beginning of catalyst mm -hmm. but you know along the way all every book is handled at what point of view where is the time where in the timeline are we what is the point of view on this book is there a second point of view like hey here's an internal document that's been found by the other factions that we can comment on from both sides. I mean, mm -hmm. that's always a, a, a great thing to start with. Say, okay, where are we at? Who is doing the commenting? Who is actually putting it together? And that let us do some really creative stuff. And there was no master plan. Every book was looked at on its own to say, where it, where does it make the most sense to set this and to write it from what point of view? That right. was book by book. Um, and still, even today, that is really the way we still do it. We go with what makes the most sense for the book because it's such a huge universe. Say, well, we want to do this, this very narrow book about the Draconis Combine, but you don't want to forget the Davians. So how about we have it, a Draconis Combine product that was um, stolen by the Davians so they can comment on it. That way we get two factions, in, at least two factions in the book. You know, we, we do that all the time still to make sure we don't leave anybody out. And um, kind of leveraging that into, into double blind, you know, I was able to go back and, and kind of reread that in Binding Force. So I definitely want to kind of focus on those two books and ask sure. questions on there. Um, leading into it, and you can kind of, you had time to touch on this before, but in my conversation with Sam, Sam Lewis, who's got to be one of the most fun podcast uh, guests that I've had. We've had him on multiple times. Sam is awesome. But um, he, he had dropped a little nugget in that, that kind of on his way out from FASA, he had kind of like giddily dropped the bomb that uh, Leo is going to become a dominant force, make it happen, and then ran away with a smile on his face. And so it sounded like that was a fairly accurate assessment in terms of what you had going on earlier. Uh, about Sam. I'm and, not sure about dominant force, okay. but definitely from Sam and through Brian, what I heard was, we're going to focus on the Capellan. We've never focused on Confederation really at all. They've been the Baltic whipping boy for like, you know, 15 years. Yep. We want to start showcasing them and we want to make them cool. So people actually want to play 
and be a confederation faction member because there really hadn't been much of anything before that time. So it definitely was in the in the notes to focus on the confederation, make them cool, make them make them someone of uh, uh, make them rich, give them some history, give them some culture, and there's ha- that hadn't been done. So and so I got to create. I really feel like I got to create a faction in BattleTech. I mean, they already existed, but only on only on the barest in the barest possible means. The Confederation House Book was a nice start, but it seems like that was done, and then nobody looked at that book for like the next five, ten years because almost every time they showed up in 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 a, in the novels or something, they were extremely two dimensional. They had no depth to them at all. So I went back and reread that house book several times and really took it to heart and say, okay, let's take this material. Let's also update it. Let's really make these warehouses a living, breathing, you know, a system of, 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 of uh, you know, I guess you call them like almost like pseudo religious um, military organizations. I mean, they have, they have their own culture, their own mythology, their own everything. And, you know, that, that was my goal in, in Binding Force was to bring a warrior house alive. Yeah. Um, Double blind was mostly about just the machinations of how does such a small successor state stay alive? Mm-hmm. Um, and the Confederation was, was always about Max was supposed to be this brilliant guy that he could he could twist and turn and keep everyone guessing. And then he went crazy. Um, so I had to do that again and, and bring Sun Tzu up as a real character to say, how do they stay alive? Because Sun Tzu is really, really good at machinations and he's completely ruthless. He will do what it takes to make sure his realm survives. So that was double blind. Just I showed that for the first time. Uh, that, that, that's why I, I knew at the very end that he was going to basically pull the trigger himself on on uh, drop the hammer himself on uh, on a main character, right? Um, and then Binding Force was to bring a warrior house alive and show the mythology, the culture, and show it from the point of view of an outsider, so I could really dive into. Um, what, you know, as an outsider, Eris Sung could showcase all the little stuff. He didn't know anything coming in, except he wanted to belong somewhere. And so he got to learn as he went, which means the reader got to learn as 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 we went. So that's where Binding Force came from. It was just about showcasing this and bringing it alive for really the first, almost the first time ever. Definitely. And kind of focusing on double blind, that also seems to be the first time we really focused on periphery faction as well. Yep. Um, and so I'm curious, you had mentioned kind of, you know, it sounded like when you were talking about kind of the directors from uh, FASA and kind of where you're placing your your story and your timeline, it kind of put it in that kind of pre twilight of the clans. And so one, I'm really interested in kind of the decisions that led to this story, certainly for for you you know, being your first novel, and I'm not sure if it was your first novel ever, or if it was just your first Baltic novel, but uh, certainly that first one benefits from the years and years of kind of, you know, musing on what story you want to tell. And, and I'm curious of kind of how those those musings, you know, kind of manifested into that first novel for you and, and how the kind of direction from uh, Sam or the other uh, higher ups at FASA in terms of bringing in Liao and Sun Tzu, uh, but also the periphery and focusing on on the magistracy and um, and those characters for the first time and kind of how exciting was that for you as a fan and then what were the kind of challenges of kind of developing that within the only story that you wanted to tell? Double Blind was, I believe, the third full novel I had ever written. I had written two novels before that, just spec novels that never went anywhere. One large, fa- a big, a couple fantasy uh, fantasy genre novels. Um, this is my first one writing a big military sci-fi piece. Now I read a lot of military sci-fi. I was in the military for five years in the Navy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I knew I knew how to generate lingo and some of the culture of that. And I read and I read a lot of military science fiction. So that was you know, always a plus. Um, like I said, Brian, you know, from Sam's direction, Brian and Sam gave me six or seven bullet points. You know, focus on, you know, bring the Confederation in, make them look cool. Mm-hmm. Talk, you know, uh, hit hit on a mercenary, you know, hit on mercenary lifestyle of some type. Make up a unit, bring in a new one, or, or, or whatever. They didn't care. Um, they said we're going to focus on the periphery in the in, in coming source books and novels. So maybe like bring a periphery nation in if you can. They'll focus on the periphery a little bit. Um, what else did they say? Um, oh boy, oh they talked about Word of Blake. That Word of Blake was up and coming. So you know, mm-hmm. Word of Blake had to be doing something. Um, 
So again, I was, they gave me these big, a shotgun of bullet points that none of which connected to each other at that moment. There was no story. And so I had to come up with an idea of, okay, so I've got Word of Blake out in the periphery doing something. I have Sun Tzu, at the time, I was going to send a mercer unit out to the periphery to do something, and then those storylines would, would collide. And that's how I would get like all of these different factions involved um, in what was going on. As it turns out, um, the Mercer unit was not sent by Sun Tzu. So the Sun Tzu thread, thread became its own. So I ended up with three plot lines. Mm -hmm. The Angels coming off, off of New Home and heading out to the periphery, which is usually you know death for mercenaries. Right. But they were you know taking that shot. The Sun Tzu political, uh, very short political plot line of him going out to the periphery. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, the uh, Word of Blake is also out in the periphery on Astrakhazi, working with the, I think, the Hegemony and Astrakhazi and doing stuff out there. Mm -hmm. And the Angels and the Word of Blake kind of came head to head right away, where Sun Tzu's plotline was floating up above it, just showing that there was a, a bigger umbrella going on. As the, as the big political players are moving around, you go down, you see, you see you know, the Angels um are at the front of this particular political wave doing all the fighting and then you you know that there is the word of blake thing out there but you, but the you know the angel nobody else knows that word of blake is doing this that's something that's uncovered as they go yeah. and then they get to astrakhazi and that all blows up and then sun Tzu comes in you know literally at you know i don't tie him into the very very end where he comes he comes strutting on stage on a mech to say and I, my people, I am here to save you. And then, you know, that's what he does. He, <laughs> yeah. he can, he can ride it along in the parade. He can't fight. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, that's where all the, it all tied together at the very end of, of that, of those battles on Astrakhazi. And then, you know, then Sun Tzu, uh, you know, caps Demona Aziz, I think it was. And, and uh, you can see him, but you can see him tying, he, he's trying to yoke the Canopians to the Confederation. And while Emma Centrella is a very smart woman and a great leader, she's making, you know, she knows, oh, I can just, I'll, I'll just milk them for all it's worth. I'm like, yeah, but you're still making a deal with the devil. Yeah. The devil's going to get his due. And eventually, and I was, I was, Sun Tzu was playing a long game at that point. And he's, you can already tell, I think he even, he even mentioned it in the, in the, uh, in the first Sun Tzu chapter, he's not just looking at Canopus, he's looking at the Tory Concordat as well. Yep. That if he could basically, you know, get get that all that strength funneled in through his direction, not only will the uh, Confederation survive, he could go on the offensive in places. And that plot line was completely just it just spun out of whole cloth as I went, and that set a storyline that went that was moving for. Uh, oh my God! I mean, how long did that storyline run? Ten years. We're, I mean, we're still dealing with the aftermath. I mean, he broke the Concordat. The Concordat actually kind of like fell apart under the, with Grover Straplin and all that, under the uh, demands of the Confederation and the Trinity Alliance. And uh, so Sun Tzu kind of soaked, you know, soaked them dry, uh, brought the Canopians up as a, as a real partner, but always with him able to keep his thumb on the direction it was going to point. Right. So... Um, that was a very long, I mean, that, that plot line could have been just a one and done, but because FASA loved it, they kept bringing that back and we, we kept the Canopians involved and the Torians involved and, and we're still telling that story. Even now in, in the Ill Clan era, um, the Centrellas and the Laos are still related in, in, by blood in a lot of places. Um, they still work together in a lot of places. They're having some difficulties at the moment. You know, the, you know, the, uh, the Canopians are starting to like, maybe looking like, Hey, should we screw with Lao at this moment? But in the end, you know, family's family, and I wouldn't turn my back on them. Yeah. The um, you brought the word of Blake as that as that third faction, and uh, you know, I had in my own kind of reread through, I made it up to a blood of heroes and and skipped ahead to double blind to kind of get ready for our conversation. And so there might have been stuff I missed there, but it also seemed like that was an early stage of word of Blake kind of taking the place as Comstar as kind of that that. Uh, you know that master manipulating faction there is you know is that right was was yours the first time where word of blake really kind of started to take that place or was that a thread that had been kind of coming through and did you guys know where that was going or was it just I, kind of set the seed so that we could possibly use it later 
I believe Demona Aziz shows up in a Mike Stackpole novel or two before that moment. So she was already a character on stage, I believe. The 6th of June movement, I think, was mentioned somewhere in a source book, but not much more than that. That There was a movement called the 6th of June based on when, um, I'm, I'm probably getting this wrong, was it when Minda Waterley was assassinated by by Anastasius? I'm, I'm, I might be might be dropping the names wrong here, but anyway, 6th of June was, was based on that and the idea of assassination as a tool of statecraft. Mm-hmm. Um, Saint Cameron Saint Germain, I think, was a character I invented to- completely to be the leader of the Sixth of June movement inside of Word of Blake. It's been a long time. I'm pretty sure I'm getting okay. get this right. <laughs> Twenty five years. Um, ago. So, so, so some of this was already existing. Some of it I just tacked onto. We knew Word of Blake was going to be coming up, becoming more important, and eventually Word of Blake and Comstar were going to, you know, you know, go head to head. We weren't sure how it was going to look. We just knew it was going to happen. That they were going to be a a competing Comstar faction, secularism versus spiritual versus the spirit fake spiritualism, and to see where that went. Um, and I, I moved by by uh, when they let me. When I realized later, I had to kill Demona Aziz. That someone had to pay the price. You know, someone on the bad guy side had to kind of pay the price for for this uh, debacle out in the periphery. Uh, I originally, I really thought it would be Cameron St. Germain, and in the end, it ended up being Demona Aziz, and Cameron was Cameron was a survivor, mm-hmm. and he went on to become a major political figure, um, you know, power player in the inner sphere, dealing with Catherine and other people, so being you know being able to uh, play at that level. Um, at that because at that, at that point, I was pretty sure Demona Aziz had had pretty much risen to her the highest she was ever going to rise as a good character. Um, uh, at that point, I thought Karen had more more room to grow and be more interesting. So that's why Demona was the one that eventually they got uh, they got they got capped by Sun Tzu, and uh, it was a good. It was again she had a good you know she had a good scene on the way out, and it, it was a fun moment between Sun Tzu and Naomi, and you know continuing the corruption. I mean the education of Naomi Centrella. And- <laughs> Indeed, you had mentioned kind of the the dueling nature of Constar and Word of Blake, kind of as a as a yin and yang, and and I. You know, and, and reading that I saw, and certainly kind of in the settings that you chose, a lot of similarities between kind of a, a Sunni and Shiite type of, um, I guess, coexistence and kind of uh, friction uh, within the culture, and certainly kind of the setting that you chose, uh, you know, for this book, you know, in kind of a very Middle East type setting, a lot of the tribalistic um, traditions and, and culture there. Um, is that you know, certainly Battletech kind of drawing from military history, is that kind of a uh, an intentional kind of parallel that you guys have have taken uh, through true history? Or is that just kind of a, you know, coincidence in terms of uh, the similarities? That's a great question. And unfortunately, I don't I don't have a good answer. I would say that would be a question of Mike Stackpole, who is a, uh, I believe he is a major in history. He's had a degree in history. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't surprise me at all that Mike was doing all that intentionally. I mean, in the end, Comstar was a pseudo-religious faction mm-hmm. with a secular uprising, and when that happens, you always get conflict. You get you get you get uh, you know heresies and 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 uh, you know splinter groups and all this other stuff that happens. Uh, his history is is resplendent with many many examples. What was Mike's uh, um, inspiration? For that and and fastest inspiration because I'm sure it was I'm sure this was not just just Mike I'm sure it was Mike and Brian and Sam in, in a meeting somewhere yeah you know in a creative summit talking about how they're going to split Comstar up and Comstar Word of Blake that was probably you know designed but what his model was it wouldn't surprise me because he is a student of history um, when I got it it was already start you know, it was already on the path so I was already told this is the this is who Word of Blake is. This is who Comstar is. Just keep it going. And then the Astra Kazi uh, uh, overlay was just completely random happenstance. I, I looked at some of the worlds that the, that the final battle could have been on, looking for a fun place to explore. I found Astra Kazi, and I'm not sure, the, one of the peripheries, Star Corps source book somewhere. And, and so I was like, you know, right out of like, you know, Tales of the... Uh, 
uh, what was it? The uh, uh, Arabian Nights tales, you know, tales of Arabian mm-hmm. Nights. Like that's the, that's all I knew about Astrakhazy. It mm-hmm. was very kind of Middle Eastern Arabian Nights, and that's what I had to work with. Everything else, I just kind of went from there and invented as I went, and tried to come up with like some of these older uh, 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 Arabian tropes, like the the uh, you know the, the the whirling dervishes, the the uh, the opulent uh, uh, pasha shah uh, vizier kind of like lifestyle, um, the 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 remnants in the desert who are always with their with their little uh, ideas of like someday we will inherit the world, but meanwhile we're just trying to survive. And I just throw all that together and, and just kind of into a big bag and shook it up to see what would come out. Um, so it, any parallels and other things that happen in there about is just completely by accident. And one, of, I think one of the parts of that book that I enjoyed the most was your descriptions of the, the mounted horsemen and kind of, you know, combining that in infantry and, and mech tactics. Was that, was that inspiration from various gameplay that you had, you had done or a particular interest in kind of, uh, the relationship between infantry and mechs, because that, that theme did continue into binding force, which we'll talk on when we get there. Um, uh, when I broke the angels and they went and they got scattered in the desert and they found mm-hmm. they met the desert tribes, I had a, a vague idea the desert tribe would keep them alive and help them get back on their feet. Mm-hmm. As I invented the culture of this de- these these desert tribes out there, and it was just kind of came as I was writing. At that point, I saw the final battle. I knew I was going to have these these tribal warriors on horseback charging the field. And I had to make sure that, first of all, you would believe that they're crazy enough to do it, <laughs> or they believe they believe enough to do it. And I had to give them the chance to win. So they had, a, you know, they already had enough native talent, and they were taught enough that they could literally ride horses against battle mechs and take take you know, take some down, you know, with with their with swarming techniques. Battle mechs have always been, uh, but battle mechs have always been susceptible to infantry swarm techniques. Yep. Uh, but just the idea of a few mechs and this the, the, this cavalry charge, um, I just thought this this is something. And it's right out right out of like you know, um, uh, like Lawrence of Arabia kind of stuff. Like this whole thing where they're charging these superhuman, you know, super sized walking tanks. Like this is going to look cool. And it's going to be a bloodbath, both. Um, mm-hmm. But it made for a very a, a awesome way that bring again all these stories suddenly just come together mm-hmm. in, in one moment. And that may be just one of the one of the scenes. Even today, is one of my top, like I say, five favorite scenes I have ever written for BattleTech. Um, that is definitely one of them. Uh, and even even today, people talk to me about that scene all the time. Uh, the, the, how how you know, that how it came together, how it was written, you know, and uh, yeah. So I, obviously, I think I wrote something there that just is going to last because it's just people keep bringing it up. You know, 15, 20 years later, uh, whatever. Yeah, twenty it's, years later. It's twenty five, Lauren. Not twenty five years later. I don't know how long. <laughs> um, so moving on, uh, yeah. to binding force. You know, first talk to me a little bit about kind of from a broader view, what you learned writing that first book and how you leveraged that into Binding Force, because having read them, like I could see the evolution of you as a writer, you know, and it may have just been the story, you know, in terms of how it flowed, but Binding Force just, there was a much, much more cohesive flow, whereas I felt like Double Line, there were a lot of very interesting points, but with Binding Force, it was just like clean read through, you know, easy page turner in addition to those kind of, you know, memorable scenes. And so I'm curious in terms of for you and your evolution, what happened? What did you learn? What lessons did you kind of try to leverage into binding force and then beyond with your writing from that first experience? Um, Let's say about binding force was I was given a lot more just leeway to write whatever book I wanted to write. Mm -hmm. Um, They said, so I went, I I chose to go back to the Confederation. I'm pretty sure I was, I was saying, well, here's, we have an open slot. What do you want to write? But, you know, I want to go back and write a Confederation book. I want to, yeah. I want to really explore these warrior houses. They look really cool. Yeah. Um, the other thing they said was uh, that um, in Binding Force, that they were, you know, compelling, they were they're going to go on more of an aggressive stance to start, like, you know, doing stuff. That's all mm-hmm. the direction. That, that one, I was only given very vague direction. Go do something cool. Show them being, like, you know, proactively, you know, mm-hmm. going out and trying to claim new territory or do whatever they need to do. Yeah. 
And uh, I invented, you know, Eric Sung, was, uh, he came up, he came to mind right away. In fact, the, the first thing I wrote was the, uh, I wrote that chapter of Eric Sung uh, sneaking into the warehouse as a character backstory moment. Wasn't even sure if I would use it in the book, end up leading, you know, leading with that. Yeah. Because it was, it became so critical to the story of, of Eris. Um, and uh, with Dole Blind, I had been given, like I said, like five, six of these big plot points I had to roll together. And I was a brand new writer. Yeah, this was my third book I'd ever written in my life. So, yeah, it was, um, I felt like I, you know, the, the chapter by chapter stuff was, I was solidly in my chapters, but I was playing with pretty powerful you know, dynamite at that point. And I, the fact I did not completely blow up my face was, was awesome. With Binding Force, it was a smoother story. It was a smaller story too. I mean, obviously it took place mostly on one world with some flashbacks. Yeah. So it was a smaller story. It was a story more about a, a handful of characters that were always, you know, somewhat nearby and, and Eris's, uh, uh, become, you know, Eris's journey to become part of that family. That he'd mm -hmm. always wanted, and it took him, you know, effectively, you know, decades, you know, to to before he was actually finally accepted, even marginally, because he was always the outsider. Yeah, um, and that was that was just that was just the that was the root of the story I wanted to tell. So, uh, more focused character um, pantheon, smaller plot line stories, because we're not dealing with these, you know, major political figures all, you know, making their doing their thing. Uh, it was just. I could back up and take a breath. That's why it, it felt it felt smoother, and uh, I didn't know I would ever come back to them. I didn't know I was going to later do you know the Capellan Solution books back to Eris Sung in the Warrior House. At that point, I had no idea I was going to do that. I was just doing this one story. I thought I thought I'd be another one and done. Um, yeah. yeah, it was a very smooth, very uh, smaller, smoother story. Absolutely. And the, I'm assuming, you know, those mini reads of the Capellan source book is what kind of inspired the, to pursue the warrior houses. What is it that kind of captured um, your imagination with those? Um, that there is a spiritualism and, and, a, and a mythos. Um, they're, they have their, I mean, every culture has its own, its own myths, its own, mm -hmm. its own traditions and culture and myths that become part, that become ingrained. Um, being able to explore that was, was fascinating. Be able to explore this, this, uh, the the spiritual, like you know, the warrior monk kind of a of a philosophy is to me what kind of caught me. I think originally with the warrior houses that they were both confederation and yet somewhat independent, and how that would work. Um, so uh, House Soritsu was just luck of the draw. I think I think I, I looked for one that had just almost nothing written on them, so they were a blank slate. I could create what I wanted without worrying about doing anything that was considered like, you know, against continuity. Uh, there was almost nothing written about them at all. So uh, I think there was like the name of the warrior house leader um, whose name I can't remember off the top of my head at the moment, but uh, I think that was it. Warrior house Aritsu, here's their current leader. That's all they knew. So I was able to just move forward from there. And so again, when you're, when you're writing these books, when you're, when you're writing any book, uh, as the writer, you're looking for a character that engages you as a writer um, and a story that you want to explore and a culture or a setting that you want to explore. Um, generally, that's why writers don't aren't usually content to just sit there and tell the same same character in the same setting over and over and over again. Right. Because um, some people do that, but most writers tend to want to push themselves to, to grow as well. And so... Uh, I look for things like that, and the warehouses caught my attention. Um, when I when I invented Eris Sung, that I knew I had the right character as the you know he was the eternal outsider, always looking for acceptance, um, and that's something I think any reader uh, has, has, has. We've all had those thoughts along the way in our lives that you know we, we're always you know, on the outside looking in, mm -hmm. wanting acceptance. So I was playing with a very familiar theme that everyone could relate to, and I just I just rolled with it. I basically set, I set it up. And like most of my books, I don't plan it out to the very end. I set up the beginning. I have a vague idea where I want to end, and I just push it forward. And then the writing takes me where the writing takes me. And generally, I hit somewhere near where I was aiming for, but I get surprised along the way. Yeah. Um, I didn't know Eris was going to get separated from his unit and go solo for a while. 
Yeah. That was not my the whole, whole jump in the water and how, how to get how to get a mech underwater. Mm-hmm. That was completely like when it happened, I'm like, oh, okay. So mostly because I thought this is getting too easy. Yeah. And so I had to get Eris out on his own. I had to split them up to have some, you know, break up into multiple plot lines that bring them back together. And uh you know, doing a whole chapter about how could you get out of a mech that's submerged in, in a lake. I mean, that kind of thing. Um, and then come back again, come back with some Capellum culture with the dragon boat races. We can get to his mech again and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, just, you, you go with, you go where the writing leads you at that point. And if that means you, you are aiming for a new ending, well, so be it. That's very cool to hear. Like I, you know, the, uh, the air pressure in the cockpit I found particularly interesting. I wonder if that is a Navy, you know, you pulled that out of your Navy experience of things. A little bit. Know. I mean, this, you know, and also I'm a scuba diver. So, I mean, I, I understood mm-hmm. how to equal, you know, equal equalizing pressure and how that works with like, you know, um, submersibles. So, yeah. I mean, I, I pulled a little bit, of, a little bit of everything from my experience in the military and my, in my scuba diving experience. And just, it really was, it was just a problem to solve. And it wasn't, as long as you can control some very basic elements, it wasn't too hard to do. Um, the question was how much water I wanted to get in the cockpit for later for, you know, for, for fun, having water sloshing around in there just for fun. <laughs> right. Um, um, and that's, and that, and that's also very cool to hear that you hadn't planned that separation because, you know, that separation plays wonderfully into the backstory that you had laid for Eris, you know, as kind of the street urchin, you know, the, the pickpockets, you know, and Maverick, how- you know, kind of a Maverick character. He, 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 he was the guy, he'd be the guy that would break off on his own because it was, mm-hmm. that's what was in front of him. That was the, the best decision for him to make at the time. Mm-hmm. And then it, then it was all about getting home again. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And even and even how no other, uh, you know, mech warrior in that unit could have done what he did in terms of infiltrating the local, you know, underground population using that to kind of leverage for information. It was it was just a very fun, cool element of this. That, that's what that's what the warrior house leader saw in him from the beginning. Mm-hmm. And 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 then and then and Ty Ty uh his his immediate commander almost never ne- never recognized until really toward the very end. Um that the warehouse leader saw in him that this is something that we don't have. This is potentially an arrogance, a a view, a level of uh just uh, desperate competency that we are lacking. So mm-hmm. she saw that this was something that could make the warehouse stronger over generations. Eris was a catalyst for growth for that warehouse. That's what I, that's how I always thought the warehouse leader saw him as. And then when when uh, Tai Nan became the warehouse leader, uh, then or later, that was part of his growth as as a commander, as a leader, to accept the fact that Eris has something to offer the warehouse. And I'm probably, I'm probably not blending into the Capellan Solution books along the way there. Not, but not uh, that was always, again, that was always kind of plan that there was, you know, you got the person who sees value in the in the young gutter punk and the guy right in the middle who's resisting change the whole way through. So right. Eris, Eris was a catalyst for change. And there was, you know, quick aside, you know, I thank you. At, you know, I always like to kind of paint maps that describe things. And so you describing Eris's wraith as metallic blue and only metallic blue. As a novice painter, it's very easy to paint <laughs> a metallic blue wraith. I'll tell you. I, I have I, seen so many versions. So yeah. uh, that metallic gunmetal blue. Yeah. Um, I have had so many people show me their idea of what that what that is. Yeah. Um, just a fun, it was just a fun comment I made. And I, I have seen... So many painters show me. Here's what I think gunmetal blue is on a battle mech, and I was, it's just it's always <laughs> awesome. Yeah. This one little, again, just a little throwaway thing I did, and yet mm. it has inspired people to paint the wraith. Yeah, and I've seen so many versions of it, and each one is fun. I love it. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, and I, I uh, took Bruce's uh, artwork for the cover and, and turned it into a, C- a TCG card as well. So yeah, I've had a little fun with that. Um, one element of this book that I also found very fun, and there was a little bit of it in Double Blind, was just that there was a large section focused on the zero Z zero G combat operations, and I'm, I'm um, you know, certainly there's a naval element to that, you know, adding the zero G element to to the naval side. But uh, you know, what uh, you know is that something that particularly fascinated you, and you wanted to kind of explore in your books, or is it just something that kind of happened to fit in the story, and, and that you uh, just ran from each of those first two novels? Yeah, the zero. So, so again, looking for. I'm trying to remember when I did the where the zero G chapter was in Double Blind. I remember there was was that the 
there was an agent sent to try to assassinate them, and yeah, uh, it was a zero. Was zero, zero had stumbled G, on uh, them. Yeah, uh, they were trying to sabotage the mechs, and then they stumbled yeah. on them. Yeah, it was a zero G like fist fight kind of thing, wasn't it? Yeah, yep. yeah, they're going on. So I was set, I was trying at that point. I I knew I needed to do something just to bring mm -hmm. in some tension. That there was something going on, and I knew there would be like a saboteur. The zero G thing was just, um, I, as I recall, reading back twenty five years, was just a way to add some spice to it, you know, to do something different. Mm -hmm. I don't remember us having seen that very much. Yeah, and it was so. It was just like you know, I would make it in during zero G evolution. So just just to make it difficult, as opposed to just hey, you stop, and then they punch each other and someone falls down. I I needed to. to make it to more of a tactical problem that you got to now surmount the zero G issue as well. So I believe I brought that in just to make the, make the chapter more entertaining than just, I caught a saboteur mm -hmm. what's going on. So it, it, it drew out the, the action scene uh, a little bit. And again, when I, when I do chapters like that, if the chapter feels too simple, I look for some way to complicate it. Mm -hmm. um, it could just be a, a, a character we didn't expect to walk in on it, the zero G evolutions, um, or something like it, like the, uh, the equalizing the pressure under the, I find something to do to spend some time on a real, uh, a new problem. People, oh, I wouldn't know how to do that. And so let's see how it works. And, yeah. and so something like that. So it just, it just came in, that one just came in just on a whim, but I've done that now a couple times in different books, like played around with like, you know, either, uh, zero-g evolution or some of the uh idea of how zero-g warship combat would work i got to do a lot of that in the federation uh, civil war and that was a lot of fun um and just you know i look for things just to play and try to show some show something that's never been done before or show it in a new way mm -hmm. that's never been done um for the, that obviously like well, the first time i jumped and showed a ship jump next to each other and literally ripped the spine out of the other ship like that's always been in Battletech. You don't jump next to other, you know, other cores. Bad things happen. But no one, to my knowledge, had ever shown that before. So I look for I look for moments like that. People go, "Yeah, I knew that was a possibility. That was really cool." Yeah. So I look for things like that. I don't know if you, uh, you know, with all the commitments that you have with CGL, I don't know how much time you get to look at what the fans are doing, but uh, there was one of my most recent podcasts was with a fan named Devin Ramsey, and he had created Operation Lancaster, which was like a 500-page PDF, which is like a, a whole campaign, a novel, short stories, TROs, truly magnificent, you know, fan project. And uh, there was a lot of zero-G in that as well, which kind of you know, made me think about it here. Um, but, uh, you know, I recommend, you know, it's about 60 pages for the story itself. Um, you know, if you have an interest, I definitely recommend checking that out. Well, I, I hope he, I, I hope he takes some of that and, and we have shrapnel. I mean, he could, he could send pieces of that. He, I, for... Last I talked, I think he was third or fourth in line. And so he's, he's, uh, he's on his way there, but, and actually, um, I, I, he... I read, I do read a lot of fan stuff whenever, you know, I, I, I trip over fan stuff all the time. And I'll always pop my head in, take a look around, and if I see something worth mentioning, I might drop a note to someone. Um, I came in as a brand new freelancer, and I always encourage people. I love what I do, and it's led to a very fun career doing awesome stuff. Um, and I always try to encourage people: if you love this, then write, submit, put it. Up, you know, we have Shrapnel now, which is a great place for people to go and and get early publication credits and learn how to do what we do. Mm -hmm. um, and I always say, you know, always, always will color outside the lines, but stay on the page. You know, don't don't go trying to create a brand new battle tech, but do something we haven't seen before. Show us a piece of battle tech that we've never seen before. There are thousands of potential story points that we will never see. Battle tech is too big. So someone says, oh, I don't know all the stories I've been taken. No, there are thousands of stories that we have never even come close to seeing. Find something fun, and then then focus on that. Don't try to reinvent a war. The, you know the war. Don't try to reinvent a faction. Tell a fun story about something we haven't ever really experienced, and that's how you get into this universe. How you get published. How you get asked to write more. Um, same with source books. You want to stay within. You want to stay on the page, but you occasionally want to color outside the lines 
Because otherwise, if someone says, well, I could have written that, that's not the reaction you want. You want those, oh, I never thought about it that way, or oh, that was a really cool twist. Yeah. And that's where you make a name and you become a, a, a favorite author, I think. You just become a place people fans come back to because you're going to surprise them in some in the little ways, not the big ways. Definitely. And actually, you know, I have a note that Devin wanted me to share with you um, that uh, was related to his own experience with Battletech. And I always like to, to fair, uh, share a little fun little anecdotes that make people feel good. So I'm going to read this for him. So this is from Devin Ramsey, creator of Operation Lancaster. So Lauren Coleman actually had a positive impact on my relationship with my mother back when I was a senior in high school. For the longest time, she hadn't really approved the Battletech, most likely because she viewed it as a violence without substance. After becoming extremely frustrated with her negativity regarding Battletech, I wanted to show her that there's a genuine substance to the property. I had just fi finished reading Battletech's then newest book, Endgame, and I decided to take a chance. I gave the book to her to read. The difference in her attitude regarding Battletech was night and day. She still had no personal interest in it, which is not surprising, but the negativity was gone overnight. Thank you, Lauren. That is awesome. And that is exactly why I write to, to, I mean, would I, would I write, whatever they, oh, this will, this will help someone have a better relationship with their mother someday. No, mm -hmm. but I try to write stories that, that challenge people mentally and emotionally as well. And, uh, Endgame, those three books, ending and Endgame were, um, there was a lot of emotion wrapped up in there with, you know, Victor was falling apart. His friends were trying to put him back together. There were a lot of amazing patriotic moments as well as personal moments in that book. So yeah, uh, the fact that that assists someone to have a better relationship with, with their mom, dude, how, how can you not feel something, you know, feel wonderful about that? Uh, so yeah, that, uh, the, it was Devin, right? Devin. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that makes that right, right there. That's, that has made my day. Seriously. That was a beautiful letter and a beautiful anecdote. And, uh, yeah, thank you. That's great. You're welcome. So, you know, you've been putting all these people on the spot of what Battletech means to you. So can I put, <laughs> can I put you on the spot? I'll have to get my only little short clip video and you can share it on, on uh, the Cows website. So yeah. Lauren, what does, what does Battletech mean to you? Possibilities. It means to me, it's a place where I, I get to explore a, a lot of what I want to as a writer and as a reader of military science fiction. Um, There's not just about the glorification of violence, that it's about the cost of ambition, the cost of patriotism, the cost of nationalism. It's about what we pay for what we believe. It's about the possibility, the endless possibilities that are out there for us as, as, ex, as a, I guess you call it, a, as an extra planet, extra solar system society, that in the end, human nature is not going to change that much. We are still a very weird species that, that will sometimes do awful things, and then we can do amazing things. And that's never going to change about us. And that's what's our strength, as well as just what makes life worth living and worth reading about. So Baltic for me, is about po the, all the possibilities of who we are, what we can become, but also that baggage of, you know, to be a free will. Uh, ambitious species. That means we will take with us our grudges, our our biases um, with us wherever we go, and we have to overcome that. Every generation, every family, every person, and in my stories, that's always what's going on. They are overcoming something that's very, very human, with the backdrop of a universe always on the edge of burning itself to the ground because that's the that's the uh not the penalty but that's the uh legacy of our drive to explore to better to look over the next hill that's always a legacy we bring with us so that to me to me that's what Baltech allows me to do and that's what Baltech means to me is the ability to explore all the possibilities that are out there whether I'm writing or Mike Stackpole or Randall Bills, whoever's writing, is that that ability to look and see 
where, what will this cost us? What are we getting and what will it cost us? And, uh, and we got cool, really big stompy robots. So, <laughs> you know, with, with a great video, so we, so we have some great tech to play with and, uh, and just a lot of fun. Thanks for sharing, Lauren. Yeah. So stepping away from the novel side and the creator side, I want to kind of, you know, have you put your CEO hat on and we can kind of start to talk about Catalyst and kind of the, right. uh, the, the management side.